Okay. Couple things. Couple things for us to uh, to cover. <clears throat> so uh, number one, some housekeeping stuff. Did everyone get the BB Learn announcements over the weekend, reminding you of the due dates, and then today reminding you of the exam a week from today in this room? Okay. So, a <clears throat> um, couple of protocols on the exam. Uh, we, w we will have you sit as, as close in as possible. I'm going to probably try to keep that back row empty. So that's so that my proctors can actually walk that back row. Okay, so if you're seating in the back, sit, seated in the back row now, um, next Monday, please don't sit there. Sit forward if you can, okay? You'll need a number two pencil. Uh, you're going to silence your phones uh, or do not disturb. Uh, it's closed book, closed notes. It's kind of a classic traditional exam with an exam packet that will look different than the exam packet of the person sitting next to you. You'll have a Scantron. The Scantron's where your final uh, answers go. Um, I'll have extra Scantrons. You'll have an hour and 15 minutes to do the exam. It'll be 50 questions. You'll actually have some uh, images on the screen in the last section that'll rotate, that'll correspond to questions 45 through 50 in your test packet, okay? I'll talk about this again on Wednesday, uh, and you're gonna wanna come Wednesday, and, and here's why, I'm kind of giving you a hint. Nobody's asked me about this, and I didn't go over it, because I was just trying to see if you guys saw it. Do you see what I'm pointing at here? So, you should be here Wednesday, <laughs> okay? And tell your friends to come Wednesday. We'll talk a little bit more the, about the exam format on Wednesday, but um, I'm just giving you a, a courtesy hint the first time there might be a bonus opportunity, okay? Um, questions on the exam. Format. When is it? Where do I go? Yes. Yeah, so let's talk, I'm going to talk about that next, about uh, resources for studying, okay? Question up front. That was the question? What's your question? It is multiple choice. Okay, multiple choice. Um, you do need to study for this exam, okay? You need to take it seriously. And... Um, Let's talk about some study tools here in a second. But this gentleman has a question. <coughs> Say that one more time. Yeah, you can leave early if you finish early. I would highly encourage you to go back through the exam, kind of classic test-taking protocol, double-check your answers. If there's a transposition error, that's on you. Okay. If you circled it on your packet, but it didn't end up on the Scantron the way you circled it on your packet, like that's on you. Okay. But you can. But please... Be respectful of others and, like, exit quietly, as quietly as possible. Like, don't be like, yeah, nailed it, right, and then run out, okay? Or, you know, that one about, you know, skin was so complicated. What did you answer? I mean, just try to keep it quiet, okay? Yeah. It's, it's over everything up until Wednesday, okay? So, yes, the first four chapters. The exam covers everything that we've covered through Wednesday's lecture, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So TA, uh, TAs and SIs, go ahead and stand up for me. Where you guys are at, maybe raise your hand so they can see you. We got one, two in the back, okay, one kind of in the middle, two up front here. Um, so we, did you guys get the announcement on SI sessions? Okay, so those SI sessions, and what about the TA announcements? on review sessions. So this week we will have SI sessions, TA sessions, check your announcements, look at your emails. I'll probably combine everything and put it out in a push uh, BB Learn announcement so you guys know when and where to show up, okay? Um, we will have study material. The SIs and TAs are putting those together this week. They probably won't release that until after Wednesday, 
Okay, so I wouldn't look at it prior to Wednesday because it's over the content that we cover in lecture. Okay, and we haven't had Wednesday's lecture yet. Make sense? Okay. Any other? We'll have a little time on Wednesday to talk about the exam as well. Okay, now I want to switch gears and I want to talk about, um, just looking at my notes. I want to talk about the textbook. So, Caitlin, Jenna, and Sasha are our TAs that are helping you navigate questions about the GRL platform. Okay? But there's a really convenient button here called Web Support. And I, you have to log in to get there. If you're having trouble log in, logging in, email one of your TAs, okay, Jenna, Caitlin, or Sasha. Their emails are on your syllabus. Uh, but if you can get here, this is the first thing I'm going to tell you if you email me is, did you submit a ticket? And when you click on this, it's supposed to pop up. It's slow. There it goes. This is a ticket that you fill out. Okay? And you can type in here, I cannot access fill in the blank. Okay? My code's not working. Um, I'm in the wrong, I've had, I'm in the wrong section. Okay? So just try to get in here, and they're relatively quick on their response. If you had issues, and we have some documentation, you had issues over the weekend, we will deal with those. There's just a lot of you, okay? So please be patient. And if we have to do some extensions because you didn't have access to your textbook, I get it. We'll figure it out, okay? But it shouldn't have been a surprise. And if you waited and emailed me at 11 o'clock last night, guess what? I actually was awake, but I was watching a movie, so I wasn't looking at my email. I'll be honest, okay? I was watching a movie with my wife, and um, I wasn't checking my email, okay? So if you waited to the last minute, uh, I, I apologize that... Um, uh, the procrastination didn't benefit you, but we'll get it sorted out, okay? You have a quiz due this Sunday evening. So let's get this straightened out before the exam. Questions about that? If you have questions about where your TA emails are, they're right here on the syllabus, and I just pulled this off of BB Learn. Okay? All right. All right, here we go. First up, where do crayons go on vacation? Where do crayons go on vacation? What's that? No? I thought I heard something. Maybe I'm just thinking I want you to have the answer. The Grand Canyon. Oh, that's pretty good. I like that. That's clever. I have the Wax Museum. Okay. Where are pencils made? Where are pencils made? Pennsylvania. Very good. Well done. And this one actually is one of my favorite that my daughter wrote. Um, and so I'll see if I can do it justice. Uh, we were skiing this weekend, and, and she asked if I was doing the, doing the jokes. This is when she was five, and it's my youngest. She's now 13. So her joke is, what is Darth Vader's favorite dessert? Darth Vader's favorite dessert? Chocolate lava cake? Darth chocolate? Okay, that's pretty good. I think you might like this one the best. You ready? A five-year-old. I thought it was pretty good. That was pretty good. All right. You can borrow that. You just have to reference her. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, we're going to buckle down now and uh, get some material going here. So let's talk a little bit about histology and tissues. And the format of this textbook isn't just for quizzes, okay? I can obviously put quizzes into a BB Learn shell. The textbook has a lot of information in it that's relevant to what we're doing, and it's going to emphasize certain things that are different than what we talk about in lecture. Let me repeat, 
in the exam, I will write my exams from the lectures. It's one of the reasons it's important to be here, okay? I know that stuff comes up. We had someone email me that, that they had a, a tragedy and an accident, and they sent me medical information, and I'm like, I don't want to see your medical information. And I said, you know what? You're going to be fine if you can't make it today. But I told them, I said, I'd come Wednesday because of the hint that I told you guys. And uh, so those bonus assignments are only going to happen for people that are in class, okay? It's to reward you to come to class. And um, it's, it's not you know, by mistake that it's right before the exam, because I can use it as an opportunity to reinforce material that I want you to learn before, before next Monday. But if you miss lecture, or if you're taking notes, right, and you're wrestling with, hey, you go fast. Yes, I did the reading. I didn't get all the way through it. I, I understand. I looked at your slides, though, and I'm having trouble writing notes as quickly as you're lecturing. Well, you can go to the YouTube site. Has anybody been to the YouTube site? And you can rewatch the lecture, OK? And I'm recording it every day twice, two different recording methods, because technology always fails, OK? It seems a little overkill to do three recording me methods, but I'm trying my best to make sure that that YouTube site is available for you as a study tool. It's that important, in my opinion, OK? It also is great for me, because I can rewatch and make sure that I covered it. I write a great question I think is good, and I'm like, you guys tell me after the exam, hey, uh, I don't think we went over that. And I look back at the recording, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're right. I thought I said it, right? Have you run into that with professors? So, so they're really valuable tools. I put it on a YouTube site as a third party because and now it looks genius because BB Learn's going away and everybody's panicking. What about all your content? I don't have to worry because it's on YouTube, and that'll probably be here after a third nuclear war. We'll have cockroaches in YouTube, OK? Was there a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah, so the BB Learn calendar I tried to edit, but it is super wonky. So the best way to find it is going to be um, look at the syllabus. The syllabus will tell you what's due when and build your calendar off of the syllabus, OK? Or what we say in lecture. So quiz four is due this Sunday. Quiz three was due last Sunday, right? Yesterday. That answer your question? OK, yeah. My understanding is Canvas, when we migrate, is much more user friendly. And I think that's one of the reasons we're moving to it. Um, so you know, it's another important piece to come to lecture so you hear all these things. But you also should be getting updates every week of what's due. I send out like an intentional short paragraph of what's happening, OK? So pay attention to those things. OK, <clears throat> histology. What is it? It's basically microanatomy, microanatomy. And some of you are look, looking at histology, and you're like, this is the boring, most boring thing on the planet. Some of you like it. Some of you are kind of agnostic to it. Um, you don't have an opinion. Well, it's an important piece of what many of you are going to be utilizing in your next professional phase. Okay? We make a lot of decisions about histolo with histology. Okay? You take biopsies of tissue. You determine if it's cancerous. Right? You take biopsies of tissue to see if it's quote unquote normal. Is it healthy? Is it pathologic? Is it compromised? Um, how is the wound healing? Um, you know, a loved one in our family had a, had a, had a doctor's appointment uh, today, and I won't say who it was, just trying to keep it um, uh, non-personal, but they, they took a biopsy, right, and took a little bit of tissue. Of course, the nerd in me is like, I actually want a piece of it, and I want to run analysis on it and see if we get the same answer as the pathologist, right? But this stuff is microanatomy. And so it's the study of microscopic components of tissues. And remember that the tissue is a collection of cells performing the same function. And an organ is the collection of two or more tissues that work together to perform a task. So as we move into the integument, which will be our next series of lecture after the exam, 
So a week from this Wednesday, we'll, st we'll start lecturing on skin or the integument. It's important that we have these foundations. We had basic chemistry, we had basic biology, molecular biology, now we're talking about tissues. This actually corresponds really well to what's happening in lab right now, okay? And what you see on the screen, upper right, anybody know what this image is, upper right? Those of you that have already had lab, maybe you haven't, well, you haven't had lab, it's Monday afternoon. Yes? It's pointing at what? Cilia, it is, it is. I'm asking what kind of tissue it is, though, but it is pointing at cilia, so that would be a correct answer. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It happens to be ciliated. Well done. I asked a bad question, and you gave me the correct answer. It wasn't the question I was thinking of. But yeah, these are the cilia on pseudostratified columnar epithelium. How about down here? What is this lower right picture? Any ideas? Same individual? It is a nerve cell, otherwise known as a neuron. But a nerve cell works just fine. Okay. Four different types of tissue as we break them down. Uh, and you can see in these columns, we've got embryologically as well as in the adult. Embryologically, we refer to tissues as they form by the layers of the embryo. So we have epithelia and we have mesenchyme, or mesenchyme is the middle layer, epithelia is the outer layer. So in the adult, the epithelial gives rise to epithelium as well as nervous tissue. The mesenchyme gets rise to muscle as well as connective tissue, stuff that's in the middle. You can see some examples. The epithelia lines cavities and covers the body. Nervous tissue makes up the brain and the spinal cord and muscles support movement. Connective tissue that we'll talk about at length today so, so for support, like bones and tendons. Now, what do I need to keep in mind when we talk about these different um, cuts or slices as you look in lab? When you're viewing histology, like you're going to be under the microscope in lab this week, it can be very, very confusing and very deceiving. And so the, the bottom line is you can get a variety of different types of outcomes of stains depending upon what you stain it for to highlight certain things that you're looking for. So across the bottom are four distinct different looking stained histology. But these are all highland cartilage. Every single one of them. You've got a blue one, a pink one, a lighter pink one, and then kind of like almost looks like a black and white. All highland cartilage. This stain over here is actually a von Giesen, um, uh, no, excuse me, it's an elastin stain that, that sort of picks out the elastin within the tissue. So <clears throat> when you look at these pictures here, what I want you to kind of appreciate is we take a biopsy of tissue or we take a segment of tissue out of the body and we process it first. We actually send it through a series of dehydration steps because remember, it's mostly water, right? We need to take the water out. So we put it in 70% ethanol, which is basically like rubbing alcohol. And then we do serial dilutions up of 75, 70 to 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, and then ultimately in 100% ethanol for two steps of about 30 minutes each, and then it goes into organic solvent known as xylene. And then it, all the water is out of the tissue. It's completely dehydrated. Okay? Now it's dehydrated. There's no water in it, so we can actually infiltrate it with wax. And wax is hydrophobic, so it won't go into the tissue unless the water is out first. Now once it's in wax or a resin, if it's a, if it's a soft tissue, like a piece of skin, muscle, heart, uh, any organ, if it's, if it's a soft tissue, it can go into wax. If it's a hard tissue, like bone, it actually has to go into a resin, like a methacroate. You ever been into like the Phoenix airport and you found a little souvenir that was a scorpion, like in a plastic thing? That's methacroate. 
So you embed it like that scorpion, and then you actually take a diamond knife and you slice it, whether it's wax or it's the scorpion. And if you slice it when it's in the resin, the hard resin, you slice a big section, a, a big slice, thick slice, and then you grind it down and polish it. And that's what they did with the scorpion. If it's wax, you can do thinly sliced, like 6 to 10 microns. Okay? But if it's a vessel, this isn't a blood vessel, it's a piece of irrigation line, okay? My wife asked, why are you taking a piece of irrigation line to work? I said, well, because I want to demonstrate if this is a blood vessel, and we want to embed this, and it has this natural curve to it in our body, and you embed it on a large scale, and you embed it, and you can turn the block, however, but you embed it like this, and your first slice is this way, what are you going to see in your first slice of wax? What are you going to see? Anyone? Just shout it out. You don't, just, what are you going to see? Are you going to see the whole tube in the first slice? No. What are you going to see? Two circles. Does it make sense? You're going to see this circle, and then you're going to see this circle down here. That's what I'm trying to uh, illustrate by like that noodle-looking thing in, in the upper right. So depending upon where you are in the slice, as you slice further, you're eventually going to get a slice that actually comes through the back end of this tubing, right? And it's going to have a look and feel that's more of like this connection right here. So the orientation of how that tissue goes into the block is really important. You guys with me? All right. Next thing that I want to talk about is um, what color is this tissue? Anyone? What color is this tissue that we, this blood vessel, what color is it? Red. That's the obvious color, right? Of course it's red. What if it's a vein? Is it blue? Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? What if it's liver? What color is it? What about muscle? What about skin? What color are tissues when they come out of the body when you've taken all the water out, all the fluid? What color is the tissue itself? Brown? Right? Some of you want to say, well, isn't it our skin color, Dr. Keller? Right? If you have fair skin, it might be lighter. If you have darker complexion, it might be more brown or black. All skin biopsies are the exact same color. Pretty interesting, huh? I wish politicians would actually talk about this because it would be very relevant in today's world. All skin, all tissue is actually clear. This is skin. This is skin that's, that's unstained. The difference, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at this more next week after the exam when we talk about skin, but what I want to allude to is this histology. This is the top layer, the stratum corneum. You're going to learn about all these layers in lab. And then this is the basal layer, the stratum basale. And this is dermis, so it's epidermis and dermis, and this is the interface between the two. Do you see these pigmented cells? Those cells are actually melanocytes that are expressing melanin. Melanin is a protein that is a brown color that gives our skin its coloration. So the only difference in all of us in this room, because it's a very diverse group of people, is the amount of melanin that your melanocyte makes. But when you take a biopsy of skin from anybody in this room, we all look exactly the same. Some of us have more melanin than others. That's it. Some of us, our melanocytes are more active, making more protein. That's the only difference in skin color. Okay? So then how do you go from that to this? Right? This is skin. Same orientation, slightly different magnification, but it's pink in color. And, and, and a lot of times students say, well, I mean, I know skin tones, and there aren't pink skin tones. So why is it pink? Because we stain it with certain stains to highlight certain features. The pink stains collagen, an extracellular matrix protein. 
And the purple, that's known as eosin, the purple is called hematoxylin. And the purple stains the nuclei, dark purple. So that's what you're going to look at in lab this week, is you're going to see a lot of hematoxylin and eosin stain slides, H and E. It's like the foundational pathological stain that we use in pathology, okay? But you go from a clear sample to a colored sample that has features that you're trying to highlight based upon what you're studying, okay? So you pick and choose what it is that you're interested in. All right, let's talk about epithelial tissue and what it does. We break it down. We've got protection, barrier, like skin and the respiratory tract. We've got absorption, like what happens in the small intestine. That's where you get a lot of your nutrition from the food that you eat. We have secretion, like kidneys and other glands, like adrenal glands that secrete items into uh, lumens. And we've got filtration, like the kidneys. Okay. You're going to learn in lab the categories of different types of epithelial tissue. Remember, this is the top layer that either opens to the outside environment or to a lumen or like an opening. We've got simple squamous, flat, simple cuboidal, looks like a cube, simple columnar, looks like a column, very, very easy. You might say it's simple. We have stratified. Stratified just means many layers. So stratified squamous is the type of epithelium you see in the skin samples I just showed you. Stratified squamous. That stratification is for protection, and we'll, we'll get there here in a second. Stratified cuboidal, multiple layers. Pseudostratified, like what we named with the ciliated pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelium. It looks like it's multiple layers, but they all actually touch the same basement membrane. It's kind of an optical illusion. And then we have its own little category known as transitional. These things can actually swell and then flatten. And transitional is when you have a space like in the bladder where if it's empty, it doesn't need to be flat and your bladder doesn't need to be huge. If it's empty, your bladder can take up less space and you can actually have kind of wider cells that eventually can flatten as the, as the bladder expands due to the elastomeric properties of the bladder. So transitional is kind of all in a category by itself. Epithelial tissue is a tissue that actually is referred to as cell rich and matrix poor. So I'd write that down on your notes if you're taking notes. Cell rich, matrix poor. It has a lot of cells in comparison to the amount of extracellular stuff or matrix. We call it the extracellular matrix, the portion that's outside of the cell that the cell lives in. We've got junctions that hold these cells together. An example of a name of a junction is a tight junction or a desmosome. And epithelial tissue, because it's so densely populated with cells has very little space for blood vessels. The blood vessels are usually found in the underlying connective tissue. And that's the same thing with your skin, your epithelium. So I don't, I don't know, when, when I was a kid, I don't, the, the boys did this. I'm not trying to be sexist, but it was like, this was funny to the boys. We would take pins like off of the cork board and we would like put them in our in our hand, like, but sideways, so it, it, it actually didn't hurt. You know what I'm talking about? And then you'd go up to the girl you liked, and, you know, you'd be like, ah! Right? Do you guys remember this? So there's no nerve endings. There's no vasculature. You're not going to bleed if you're just at the level of the epithelium. Right? Now, if somebody took that pin and stuck it in, you know exactly what would happen, because you would get into the Dermal layer, which is vascularized, that's the, that's the connective tissue layer that's beneath or deep to the epithelium. All right. They're polarized. So they're cell-rich, matrix-poor. They're also polarized. What that means is they have a side. They have an up and a down. They have what's called a basal side, which is the downside. 
or the deep side, that's supported by this connective tissue basement membrane. And then they have an apical side, or the top side, that faces out. That's the site of secretion. That's the site of the cilia that you talked about earlier, or microvilli if you're in the intestine. And if it's going to secrete something, there's two types of secretions that can happen in the body. Number one is exocrine. And this is a term that's defined in the textbook as well. You release it in, onto the, into the lumen or onto the outside surface. So if you're in the gut, think about the gut is basically a tube, right? It goes from the mouth right here out, right? So it's just a tube. Your alimentary canal starts here, does all this kind of stuff, and then ends out that way. Everything in the lumen of your alimentary canal is considered outside the body. It's not part of the body until you absorb it across the basement membrane. So in the gut, like in the stomach, remember in the chemistry lecture, we talk about digestion happening due to pH changes in the stomach. And what did I say is manufactured in our stomach that has a pH of about 0 to 2? Anybody remember? Hydrochloric acid. You release a hydrogen ion, you release chloride ion. How do you not break down the inner lining of your stomach? Well, these goblet cells that line the stomach actually create a mucus barrier that neutralizes the acid. So you break down the contents in the lumen, but you don't break down your own tissue, which is pretty clever. Okay? This is a little beyond this class. I'm going to give you uh, an example of where this is important. How many have heard of GERD? Oh, perfect. Gastroesophageal reflux disease. So, so this is a perfect example of how I can go off top topic. I think I covered it. I don't remember. I can watch the lecture and say, oh, yeah, I actually talked about GERD in the lecture. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, where your stomach contents actually move up past the lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. And you've got hydrochloric acid that is fine in the stomach because you have goblet cells that release a mucus that's like a protective barrier. As long as those stomach contents and that acidity stays in the stomach, you're fine. The moment it starts coming up, there's no goblet cells. There's no mucus. That's where the burn comes from, right? That's why it's called heartburn because the esophagus goes right by the, by the heart. They actually thought it was a heart problem many, many years ago. It's actually an epithelium problem. Okay. Endocrine. Endocrine is a ductless system that secretes things into the blood. You're going to cover that more in uh, uh, the endocrinology section in 202. You also cover digestion in 202 as well. But this is where the epithelium that specializes is really important for 202 and lays the foundation for what you're going to cover next. Okay, so some more histology. What is this picture the hematoxyl and eosin stain slide on the upper right. What kind of epithelium is that? We've seen it before. It is pseudostratified ciliated uh, columnar epithelium. You see the little cilia up top? It's a dead giveaway. Okay. What about this bottom one? <clears throat> Any ideas? I, I wouldn't necessarily expect you guys to get this, but. Um, where, it, where it's located, but what kind of epithelium is it? Let's, let's start with that question. What kind of epithelium is it? It's a different kind of stain, right? These are nuclei that are flat, and they seem one, one layer. One layer epithelium. Simple squamous. Simple squamous. Very well done. This is actually in a blood vessel. Okay. Those are endothelial cells, the nuclei. Okay, <clears throat> continuing on the characteristics, these cells, uh, this tissue actually has rapid dividing cells. And if we think about this picture in the lower right of a person's foot, and so we, we're, we're looking at this being the outermost surface because the foot's facing this way. Does that make sense? So this is your um, dead squamous cells. 
that as they, as they turn over, they push upwards and then they slough off. So that's why, you know, if you have dry skin and you do this, the flaky skin that comes off is dead squamous cells. They're anuclear. The, the, the nucleus has been eliminated. They're dead cells. They just are forming a protective armor for you and I. Okay? Well, you've got living epithelial cells, and then you've got your deep tissue, which is your dense irregular connective tissue. And at the very bottom layer of this epithelium, we have our basal layer. And that basal layer is where you've got rapid cell division. That's the stem layer. That's the progenitor layer. That's where new skin comes from. And it takes about six to eight weeks for those cells to turn over, make new cells, and create another layer of cells. Okay, that's why when you have a wound, right, I mean, it might clot and quote-unquote provisional matrix heal in about a week, but six to eight weeks, it's not really strong until six to eight weeks. And then it's continuing to remodel for about 365 days, for about one year. Okay, we'll talk more about wound healing next, after the exam. But um, this constant ability to regenerate is found in epithelial tissue. It happens in the gut lining. It happens on your skin. Um, it happens within the oral cavity. Any epithelial tissue, it's under constant stress, and so it's important for it to be able to regenerate. Other types of epithelial. These are like non-standard. We talked about pseudostratified. And the mucus <clears throat> that is released, the cilia function to kind of move the mucus away and carry debris away. So you find this in respiratory epithelium, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So as you're breathing in air, if there's any particulates, the cilia will capture it, the mucus will capture it, and then you have what's called a respiratory escalator that actually kind of have you ever watched um, like underwater deep sea movies and you see kind of like just the, the brushing motion of, of a lot of these underwater creatures that have these cilia? That's what happens in your respiratory epithelium. We'll talk about it in my past class. We'll talk about it next year, uh, next semester in 202. But let's talk real briefly about smoking and vaping. What do you think happens to those cilia? You think it's good for them? It's not. Yeah, they, they, they become paralyzed um, or freeze, and they lose their functionality. And, and, and so some of you are thinking, oh, that's what happens with smoking, but um, w we understand that vaping, they don't have those same issues. They're actually seeing some of the same issues associated with vaping. We've got data now that's about 10, 15 years old, and it's not, it's not encouraging, okay? Um, again, important to have the video so we're not going too much into pathology, but... If you want more data on the danger of the respiratory epithelium, what's happening histologically with smoking and vaping, reach out to me. I've got tons of data I can share with you. It's pretty fascinating. Bottom line is our respiratory epithelium was made to see clear air, right? So if you're inhaling something that's not clear, it's doing a lot of filtering. And it can do that for a while, but every day for many years, takes its toll on that ability to sweep that stuff away. Transitional, we kind of already talked about transitional. This is stretching from a cuboidal to a squamous. It's only found in the bladder. And I've got a picture of it that's better than this textbook picture that can, comes from that histology DVD that's available in the lab. So this is the lumen of the bladder. This is a magnification about 400 microns. These are samples that we took. You can see the connective tissue here, uh, and you can see this transitional epithelium. These are cuboidal, and they'll go to flat squamous cells when the bladder fills. You can imagine when the bladder fills, all of this stuff kind of pushes out. It makes a wide opening, and these guys actually flatten out. Okay? So a special case of epithelium as being transitional. Now, <clears throat> the next question I have for you is the functions. Well, we talked about simple with absorption, secretion, diffusion. We have simple squamous, simple cuboidal, or columnar, and 
the simple squamous, we said, is found at the skin level or in the uh, um, lumen of blood vessels. Cuboidal and columnar help to line the digestive tract um, because that's where you get a lot of secretion of these compounds, like um, exocrine function for digestive enzymes in the gut. And then the pseudostratify, we said, sweeps the cilia away. Left image, we said, was an endothelial uh, or a blood vessel, simple squamous epithelium of a blood vessel. This middle picture are actually simple cuboidal from a kidney tubule. So simple cuboidal, meaning it's one layer of cube cells. It might be difficult for you to see that, but if you look at this picture, you can see the circle, and then you see the purple nuclei. This is a hematoxylin, eosin stain. See the nuclei. If you follow around the nuclei, there's what seemingly looks like a, like a box that a two-year-old drew. Okay? So it's not like a perfect rec, uh, square. It's kind of like, you know, box-like, like a cartoon box. Okay? Very few sharp edges in, in, in the body. So this is a um, kidney tubule, and the whole function of the kidney tubule is for absorption of water and filtration. And it's one, one cell layer thick, so that actually can happen really easily with diffusion and osmosis, right? And then the far right, another example of a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium like in the respiratory tract. Now let's look at uh, stratified. So pseudostratified is really in the category of simple, right? So let me just back up. Pseudostratified is really in the category of simple epithelium. And stratified is where you have multiple layers. Like stratified epithelium found at the level of the skin. We talked about that at length today. Anywhere you're going to have multiple layers where you might have abrasion or you might have physical trauma, um, the moving of substances, okay? Skin, mouth, esophagus, anus, and vagina, where you find stratified epithelium. Remember, the basal side still functions for regeneration. That's where the stem cells are found within those tissues. And you and I, they're adult stem cells. They're no longer embryonic because we're no longer embryos, right? That switch happens the moment you're born. Embryonic tissue to technically neonatal, which is a word that means like new birth. But neonatal, which is young, right? When you're, when you're an infant, up until about the age of 12, before adolescence, those stem cells are much more active than ours. And I just did that. I put myself in the same category as you because we're all over 12, okay? What is magical about 12? Well, now you have adolescence and things start changing. So you're no longer a neonatal stem cell. You're actually more in an adult stem cell situation. And you could probably attest to this. You might have fell off a skateboard when you are five, and you cannot see the scar. You're like, I swear it was a monster wreck. I bled for days, okay? My mom was so worried, and I can't even find the scar on my knee, right? Now you get a paper cut, and it's like, I got a giant keloid. I think I might have to have surgery. Right? So the healing properties of young cells are far superior than older cells. And that old cell motif just continues as we get older, into middle age and then to geriatric population. So the apical side dies off, sloughs off, is expelled. So we've got pseudostratified epithelium on these two, the far left and the middle. And then this is another skin picture on the far right, stratified squamous. Questions? All right, cool. Oh, one question back here. It's a great question. So the, let me repeat the question for the video and people in the back, uh, or maybe in the front, if you couldn't. They're kind of in the middle. Um, 
The question is, why does the body do that? Why does it change? Why does it shift on the behavior of the cell around the age of 12 uh, before you go into adolescence? It's a great question, and the, the truth of it is we don't really know. But what we do know is that there are kind of clear changes in an individual's life that are tied to the genome. So, for example, um, embryologically, uh, it's a hypoxic environment. That means low oxygen in utero. Okay, you're, you're actually stealing oxygen from your mom in utero. Like, the fetal hemoglobin molecule has a higher affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin. So you literally steal oxygen from your mom. Okay, so shout out to moms. Text her tonight. Thanks for the oxygen. Love you. Okay? The moment you're born, those hypoxic genes shut off instantaneously the moment the infant takes their first breath. And those genes go completely silent. One is a, a, a gene called uh, hypoxia inducible factor, or HIF1, H I F 1. It turns off the moment you're born, the moment you take a breath and you're starting to oxygenate your, your body. Now your oxygenation levels go up, and that gene. That's the signal for the gene to shut off. It's not needed anymore. There's a lot of theories on HIF1 alpha. Uh, that's a variation of HIF1, hypoxia inducible factor, being kind of like the holy grail of youth, helping with a lot of regenerative potential. Because in utero, we have this single cell entity, single cell life, going multicellular, going to a human in nine months. We can't replicate that in the science and medicine world. We, we just can't. We don't know how, we don't, we're not smart enough. But it happens in utero, okay? It's amazing science, it's a miracle, call it whatever you want, but we know it takes place. And then it changes the moment you're born, like that. Then at the age of 12, now adolescence sets in and the endocrine system starts flooding boys and girls with different hormonal levels. And there's a lot of changes that happen with skeletal architecture, muscle, um, connective tissue, hair growth, sexual organ development. And that also turns on new genes and turns off others. So for example, one gene that shuts off at 12 with adolescent flood of hormones is elastin, the gene for elastin. And so in my lab years ago, we actually spent a lot of energy sequencing the uh, gene for human elastin, and we actually express it uh, recombinantly. And we use that because we don't make it now, none of us, because we're all over 12. It has a half-life of about 70 years in the body. So, you know, at the age of 70, about half the elastin you had when you were young. And that's why skin is saggy and wrinkly. That's why your blood vessels are also look like that, your bladder, your heart, because elastin is wearing out. And that's like a rubber band. Elastin is a stretchy protein that gives elastomeric recoil. So it's part of the aging process. So I don't have a great answer for you, but I could talk for a long time about all the things that happen. But it's just interesting at moment of birth, pre-puberty, and then everything else is after that. There are other genes that turn off with age and other ones that turn on. But for the most part, 12 and on is where telomere length shrinks. Telomeres are part of the genome that uh, protects the gene. Um, and they just get progressively smaller as we get older after the age of 12. And once they get too small, you can't replicate the cell anymore. And theoretically, that's kind of your expiration date when your telomeres are too short to allow for replication. Does that make sense? Okay. That answer your question, sort of? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's get into connective tissue. We were on epithelial tissue. Now we're on connective tissue. And... Connective tissue is something that is determined by the cell and the matrix types. It connects, it binds tissues together. <clears throat> it's the glue that holds tissues together, it holds an organ, an organ's multiple tissues. It puts bones to bones or muscles to bones, like tendons and ligaments. It, it binds damaged tissue together when we heal. This is a, a picture of a process known as cicatrization. It comes from some, um, it, it's actually a French word, it comes from a French word for scar. And it's a process by which 
uh, men and women deliberately injure the skin to create a scar pattern, like, like a tattoo. Like, uh, like what you saw with uh, Michael B. Jordan in um, um, the Marvel movie, right, with Black Panther. You guys know what I'm talking about? So it's a, it, it really, uh, its origin, we believe, um, from a book by Angela Fisher is uh, a, an African origin, an African tribe group uh, that kind of began the, the cultural process. But it's a great example. Black Panther is a great example of what connective tissue can do, like the scarring. You're like, I did not watch that movie and think that the Black Panther was a great example of cicatrization. But it is, okay? So now you watch it, you'll never be the same. But another feature of connective tissue is <clears throat> that it helps to support and protect. And, you know, connective tissue is considered cell poor and matrix rich. So it's the opposite of epithelium. Cell poor and matrix rich. Lots of extracellular stuff. A lot of matrix. Um, it forms organ capsules. It supports and protects bones. It cushions like articular cartilage that's shown here between the distal aspect of the uh, femur and the pro proximal ac uh, a aspect of the tibia. That cartilaginous tissue that cushions and supports. So ask your mom or dad at their age if they feel like their articular cartilages are still holding up. Okay, They're probably going to tell you if they're active and they were athletes when they were younger that their knees hurt because that stuff wears out okay it's found around um, organs and it cushions and insulates it's found beneath the skin all of us have no matter how lean or athletic you are all of us have a layer of hypodermal fat underneath the dermis. So it goes epidermis, dermis, and then hypodermis. And that layer is very fat-rich, a lot of adipocytes, because it helps cushion, right? You get, like, hit, it helps to absorb, and it's a great storage of energy all throughout our body, okay? The um, <clears throat> connective tissue um, can also store in support the transportation of nutrients, like we talked about with adipocytes. Now we actually have fatty acids available that can run through an oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP. And you have stores of it throughout your entire body surface or just beneath the surface. Bone marrow, that's where blood precursor cells are found. The bone itself stores calcium. Blood is a type of connective tissue and it transports nutrients. So if you look down here, we've got bone that stores calcium. We've got red blood cells found within a matrix environment of the blood. The blood is a liquid matrix, right? Think about it. When you bleed, the liquid matrix turns into a solid architecture. That's the scaffolding that forms, right? As the platelets take over and you start putting down fibrin. This is marrow space within the long bones of the body. In the marrow space of the long bones, we have bone that's trabeculated. That's that T or the darker pink. And then these open white circles are adipocytes or fat. Right? More connective tissue found in there for the storage of nutrition. So... Overall, what we see is cell-poor, matrix-rich, a major component or characteristic of connective tissue. These immature cells, we refer to them as blasts, and a mature cell, we'll call them a site. So in the bone section, when we get into the skeletal system, you'll see that we'll say an osteocyte is a mature bone cell. Osteo from the root meaning bone, site meaning cell. And an osteoblast is an immature bone cell that's actually in the process of making more bone. Matrix-rich, this is the outside of the cell. 
what we know as the extracellular matrix. Any takers to tell me what type of connective tissue this is? There's a lot of overlap between lecture and lab in this section because you're going to be looking at this at length. So just given you prepared for lab, it is areolar connective tissue. Well done. Areolar is a very open type of connective tissue. You can see, again, this is a hematoxylin and eosin stained tissue. Pink staining collagen, like I told you in the very beginning. This is a collagen fiber right here. You can see all these pink strands are collagen fibers. And then the elastin stains a dark black color, almost a really deep purple that kind of looks like a black on histology. And that actually is the elastin fiber. So what you're looking at is you're looking at the architecture within tissue that cells live within, the connective tissue. It binds things together. It connects things. It supports. It, it cushions. Provides energy source. And the support here is Collagen gives it a lot of tensile strength. Tensile strength, T-E-N-S-I-L-E. -E. Tensile strength means it won't fracture. Okay. Elastic fibers or elastin gives it flexibility, the tissue flexibility. That's why we don't walk like robots. Even our bones have about a 4 to 7% elastin component, depending upon where you are in the body. So if you put pressure on a bone, it actually will flex a little bit. Now, what happens is you are 75 years old to the elastin com uh, content in your bones. Is it what it is now in this chair? No. So we say that bones are more brittle in our older population, and that's absolutely true. Now, they also start losing calcium uh, and, and uh, hydroxyapatite, but they lose a lot of elastin as well. you gotta got to like a perfect storm, unfortunately, in our older population. And if you're female, postmenopausal, when estrogen goes away, now your sort of bone-saving uh, mechanism is, is off. And that's why postmenopausal females are at higher risk of developing bone disease, or what's known as, good catch, osteoporosis. Okay, really good catch, man. That also goes down as you get older, reflexes. Okay. Some other characteristics of um, connective tissue. So this is a cadaveric section. So you can kind of see that the tendons have been pronounced. And you can see the dissection at the level of the fingers. And then the skin has been peeled back uh, to reveal the tendons. Like there are really very few muscles in your hand. They're basically all bones and tendons. And most of the muscles that control them are in the forearm. Okay, so it's like a puppet on a string. You contract the muscle here, and it tugs on a tendon, and the digit moves. Interesting, right? So think about how puppets move and where those strings are actually attached. As you get in lab and you start thinking about articulations and movement, this should actually help you visualize how this takes place. Connective tissue is highly vascularized, except cartilage, ligaments, ligaments, and tendons. All other family of connective tissue is very well vascularized. These three are not, so don't miss this on the exam. Let me repeat this. Generally speaking, connective tissue is highly vascularized, meaning it has a lot of blood vessels, a lot of blood flow. In order to heal a tissue, the number one thing that you need is blood flow to heal the tissue. So if you tear cartilage, ligaments, or tendons, and you know that it's not well vascularized, how well do you think it heals? And some of you are like, well, I could tell you, Dr. Keller, because I did that in my left knee. I did that in my right shoulder, right? That's why they don't heal well, is they're poorly vascularized. A lot of the surgeries that you went through or a lot of the um, technologies that were employed to try to heal you were to try to revascularize those structures in order to try to get them to heal. Okay. Now, the matrix components, are made up of some really interesting um, players. We've got a gel component, and again, this is a polysaccharide. This is a picture right here of a proteoglycan. OK? 
okay, up top. This is a proteoglycan. It looks like a millipede. And you see this little box right here, this black rectangle? That's higher magnification. The bottom view is this little box magnified to help you understand what you're looking at. So this little millipede-looking structure is called a proteoglycan. Proteoglycan, it's a protein, or a, a, a proteoglycan is a sugar attached to a protein, right? Protein first, glycan second. So you have a polysaccharide, which is a many sugar, many monosaccharides that are attached to proteins. And those, those proteins are considered um, now a proteoglycan. Got it? Pretty straightforward. So, so now you can see here um, on this core structure, this is a um, glycosaminoglycan. That's what the GAG stands for. And <clears throat> these are link proteins that are actually attaching all of these sugar residues. And it has a net negative charge. A net negative charge that attracts and binds sodium, because sodium is positively charged. If you remember back to our basic chemistry lecture, sodium is plus one. If this has a net negative charge, it attracts sodium. What does water like to do when there's a high concentration of sodium? What does water like to do? Does it like to go where the sodium is, or does it try to retreat? It, it follows solute. Sodium's a solute. Water will be attracted to a high concentration of sodium, so water follows, and this, folks, is why your tissue is so well hydrated, because of these gel components made up of polysaccharides attached to proteins that are called proteoglycans. And proteoglycans is spelled out right here in the parentheses for you. So all of your tissues that are squishy and soft and hydrated, you're 50 to 75% water. Why does your tissue hold water? Because of proteoglycans. The extracellular gel that's between your cells has sugar-coated proteins that have a spot for sodium. Sodium binds. Water is attracted to it. And now you actually have a hydrated tissue. Okay? Sponge-like with spaces. It literally feels like a sponge. Resist compression, create space in our tissues. It gives our tissues its architecture. Now, the matrix components that we're looking at here, there's a fibrous component, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, elastin after this slide. So the fibrous component is made up of collagen, which is a structural protein. It's the most abundant protein in the body. About 25% of all protein in your body is collagen. And on this picture here of areolar connective tissue again, right? Am I right up front? Am I right? Is that areolar connective tissue? Yeah. All right. I got the green light. Areolar connective tissue. What are the pink rods in there? Collagen. Nicely done. What are the black squiggly lines? Elastin. Well done. Collagen. Um, oh, let me move this here. Let me see if I can. Uh, there we go. I didn't want that hidden. Collagen likes to uh, form uh, groups or bundles. So there's 20 plus different types of collagens. Most abundant being collagen one, but it goes collagen one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to I think we're at 23 or 24 now. Um, the collagens like to form fibrils or bundle together. Many fibrils actually make a bundle and they form this triple helix. Remember we talked about that in an earlier lecture where if you take a rope and you wind three cords together, it's really strong. Like a cord of three strands isn't easily broken is the old adage, right? And so your body takes that motif. Like that guideline, that design is found in us. It's not like 
the nautical community invented it or the rock climbing community invented it. It was in us first, okay? And these collagen fibrils form covalent bonds or the strongest bond in chemistry that we know of um, from one collagen fibril to another. The second main component we talked about at length was elastin, right? Thread-like, long. It forms uh, cross-linked filaments and this elastic fiber is allowed to, like a rubber band, it's allowed to stretch, relax, and recoil. Stretch, relax, and recoil. Like if you all do this little exercise, grab, your, grab the skin on the back of your hand, pull it up. You can see how far it stretches. Now let it go. And you can actually see that it just goes back to where it was, right? Now... That is a component, not of collagen. That's a component of elastin. And in this um, areolar connective tissue, the um, elastin is, in, is the green arrow or the black squiggly lines. Right? The collagen is the red arrow up top or these pink fibers or rods. And then the reticular tissue is the yellow arrow, which is in much smaller abundance. So if we look at the combos of different types of arrangements in the body, we can actually see some motifs. There are some different ratios of how we can go about doing this. We can have elastin being greater than collagen, right? You guys remember like the alligators and like which way to read that? So elastin is greater than collagen. That means more elasticity. The second one, collagen is greater than elastin. You get more tensile strength. Now, if you have gel that's greater than your fibrous component, you have more gel component, more proteoglycans, more polysaccharides that are binding to a protein, that creates a spot for sodium that water can follow and hydrate, more gel over elastin or collagen, you actually have more cushion, like what you find in cartilaginous discs between your vertebral column or between at your knees or your shoulder, between your fingers. Okay? In these synovial joints, you get more cushioning. So on the exam next Monday... I want you to be able to compare and contrast the characteristics of epithelial tissue as well as connective tissue. That's fair game. You want to give it a try? Huh? You kind of don't have a choice because we're going to go through it anyways. <laughs> but this will be good for you. What is this? Don't shout it out yet. Let's do it by a show of hands, okay? Okay. In the remaining minutes, let's take this little, this is how the exam, those image questions that I told you about, this is the format. If you were here next Monday and this picture was here, you'd be looking at that saying, okay, I'm going to put on my Scantron for question 46, my answer. This is how it'll work. And these will just rotate through. Make sense? Okay. So what is it? Who says this is A, strat show of hands, A, stratified columnar epithelium. Raise them. B, transitional. C, simple squamous. D, simple columnar. E, stratified squamous. I'd say the E's have it for sure. Well done. What is this one? I'll give you a second to digest it, then we'll do the show of hands. This is like my substitute for the poor person uh, clickers. <laughs> okay? I don't, I, want, I don't need you guys to buy something else. We can just... Have you learned without paying for technology? What is that? Everybody ready to answer? Dense, regular connective tissue, A. Adipose connective tissue, reticular connective tissue, C. D, dense, irregular connective tissue. More hands. E, areolar connective tissue. Okay, a few. We didn't really go over this, so that's fair, but we're going over it now. So do you see these collagen fibers, how they're going in 
many different directions. They're not all just aligned. So that's dense, irregular connective tissue. Okay? You'll learn more about this in lab. It'll become more clear. Okay, last one. What is this one? I'll give you a second. All right, let's do the show of hands. What is this? Uh, dense, regular connective tissue. A, adipose connective tissue. B, C, fibrocartilage. D, hyaline cartilage. E, areolar connective tissue. Okay, I, I didn't see a, an outstanding answer that was a resounding, you're confident in it. The answer is actually hyaline cartilage, D. Most cartilage tissues are going to kind of have these like frog eye kind of appearances, or frog egg rather, right? Like googly eyes. This is actually hyaline cartilage. So mark that down. The stuff that we cover in lecture is fair game for the exam. The type of histology you might see is histology that I show you in lecture, if that makes sense, okay? That's the stuff to study for lecture. For lab, you're going you're gonna to learn more stuff. Okay, a couple of reminders. I know, you guys, we, we got a few minutes. A couple of reminders. Please make sure your BBLIN is working. You know to reach out to your TAs if you're having trouble. Look for announcements on when you can go to review sessions this week, study sessions. It'll be worth your time to come to our last lecture on Wednesday before exam one. Okay? See you all Wednesday.